Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sangeeta Chaudhary once again and I welcome everybody to my channel. In today's lecture, I am going to discuss about one more liver disease that is known as NAFLD. What does NAFLD stands for? NAFLD stands for Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease. Okay. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. As the name suggests, it is different from the alcoholic fat liver. So let's discuss about non-alcoholic fat liver disease, which is quite common and it actually may lead to liver cirrhosis. Okay, so we need to know about this liver disease as well. So let's see about the definition. What is NFLD? Okay, NFLD means excessive fat accumulation, mainly triglycerides, okay, which leads to steatosis in the liver. So, accumulation of triglycerides of fat in the liver is known as steatosis. And this steatosis means more than 5% of the hepatocytes are histologically affected. What is NASH? Okay, in this slide, I'm going to discuss about the terminology. So, NFLD, we have now known. What is NASH? NASH stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Okay. So, there will be liver cell injury and inflammation in addition to excessive fat. So, NFLD can lead to NASH and NASH-related cirrhosis. Negligible alcohol consumption history will be there. Less than one drink per day for female and less than two drinks per day for male. Okay, So, that means the patient of NFLD will not have any significant history of alcohol intake. That's why it is non-alcoholic fat liver disease. And there will be absence of evidences of other liver disease. So, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We need to exclude other diseases and then we can diagnose a case of NAFLD or NASH. Let's see the risk factors of development of NASH. Okay, so there are certain common conditions which have established association with NAFLD like obesity, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome and polycystic ovarian syndrome. So, these are really much associated with development of NFLD and other conditions which are not very common but may be associated with NFLD are hypothyroidism, obstructive sleep apnea, hypopituitarism, hypogonadism, pancreatoduodenal resection and psoriasis. Okay, So these are the risk factors for the development of non-alcoholic fat liver disease. Now let's look at the pathogenesis. Okay. The pathogenesis can be of two-hit hypothesis or it can be of multi-hit hypothesis. Now, what happens in two-hit hypothesis? First hit, there will be dysregulation of fatty acid metabolism which results in steatosis or accumulation of fat inside the hepatocytes. The second hit or the second insult may be one or more of the environmental or genetic factors that cause hepatocyte necrosis and inflammation. So, in the first hit, there will be steatosis and in the second hit, there will be hepatocyte necrosis and inflammation this is about two hit hypothesis and the multi-hit hypothesis ultimately leads to fibrosis of the liver parenchyma so this is about the pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fat liver disease or nafld now in a flow chart if we discuss about pathogenesis the important associated factors like obesity insulin resistance hyperinsulinemia and increased serum leptin level in association with altered cytokine levels like increased human necrosis factor alpha and decreased adiponectin along with excessive dietary carbohydrates dyslipidemia genetic mutations associated with certain drug intake toxins nutritional deficiency and some other factors leads to accumulation of fat inside the liver cell so that means there will be steatosis because of all these associated factors it will ultimately result in steatosis of the liver parenchyma and after steatosis there will be direct cytotoxic effects of increased free fatty acid in the liver cells impaired beta oxidation of free fatty acids oxidative stress and lipid peroxidation and mitochondrial damage which will ultimately lead to inflammation and hepatocyte necrosis leading to steatohepatitis okay so this is the pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fat liver disease as well as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis 
now this is a normal looking liver histology okay and grossly a normal liver looks like this but when there is accumulation of fat grossly a liver looks like this it becomes more pale and bulky and in histologically we can see that there is accumulation of fat these are fat droplets okay this white white empty space empty looking spaces are fat droplets so this is the normal liver parenchyma which is very compact and there is no fat accumulation and this is the liver parenchymal histology of of a case of fatty liver okay what is the natural history of nafld how does it progress so if somebody develops nafld then more than 80 percent of the cases they'll have isolated fatty liver changes and almost 20 percent of the cases they'll develop into nash non-alcoholic steatohepatitis now out of this nash cases almost 11 percent over the next 15 years will develop liver cirrhosis okay and 31 percent of this liver cirrhosis cases will become decompensated over a period of eight years and almost seven percent of the cirrhosis cases will develop into hepatocellular carcinoma over a period of 6.5 years so this is about the natural history of non-alcoholic fat liver disease which may develop into NASH, NASH may develop into liver cirrhosis, cirrhosis may become decompensated or cirrhosis patient may develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Coming to the clinical features of NAFLD, clinical features, uh, if I talk about the symptoms, the symptoms are not very significant symptoms, okay. Most of the time, patient do not have any symptoms at all, okay. And in the sign, the patient may have hepatomegaly on examination. Uncommon symptoms may be vague, right upper quadrant pain, fatigue and malaise, okay. And in the later stages, we may find spinomegaly as a result of portal hypertension, spider and geoma pulmonary edema and ascites. These are the signs of decompensation of uh, liver function. Now, how do we diagnose a case of NFLD? We need to take into consideration patient's history and clinical evaluation and investigation, of course. So, patient's symptoms, there will be no specific symptoms. As I said, there will be vague symptoms like fatigue, malaise and abdominal discomfort in the right upper part of the abdomen. On physical examination, in case of uh, early stages of NFLD, we may not get anything except mild hepatomegaly. But in the later stages or advanced stages of liver disease, we'll have stigmata of all the liver cells failure like spider angioma or spider nevi, ascites, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, pulmonary edema, jaundice and hepatic encephalopathy. Now who needs to be evaluated for NFLD? The presence of any of the risk factors especially with a history of abnormal AST and ALT ratio. They are the patients who need to be evaluated for NFLD. Otherwise from sign and symptoms we will not be able to do anything in the early stages of NFLD. Okay. Now, how do we diagnose with the help of investigations that certain routine laboratory tests we do? In the LFT or liver function test, there will be elevated transaminases, alanine transaminase and aspartic transaminase. The ratio of AST and ALT will be less than 1. Alkaline phosphatase and GGTP will also be elevated. But serum bilirubin, prothrombin time and albumin levels are usually normal, okay, unlike other uh, liver diseases. An abnormal ferritin level in the presence of a normal transfer in situation should always suggest a need to rule out NASH. So again, I'm telling an abnormal ferritin level, but a normal transfer in situation should always, uh, you know, make you suspect to rule out the NASH. Okay, this is about the routine lab investigations. Now, there are certain tests to be done to rule out other liver diseases because as I said, NFLD is a diagnosis of exclusion. So, we need to exclude viral hepatitis by serum markers. We need to exclude autoimmune hepatitis or autoimmune liver disease. Congenital causes of chronic liver disease like hereditary hemochromatosis should be ruled out. Wilson's disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, polycystic ovary syndrome, drug-induced liver disease or DLE. Okay, these things should be ruled out before we level a person as having NFLD. Now, uh, if we look at this imaging test from ultrasonography, we can see that the liver looks very bright. Okay, the bright, uh, the bright liver with increased echogenicity. So here we can see a very bright liver. Okay, and here in the MRI T1 weighted images, again the liver looks very bright because fat appears bright. This is the liver, it looks very bright, whitish kind of thing. So 
fat appears bright on table when it imaging so we can take help of imaging as well and imaging plays a very important role in the diagnosis of nfld there is certain non invasive quantification of liver fat can be done with help of mri pdff mri pdff stands for magnetic resonance imaging using proton density fat fraction okay mri pdff magnetic resonance imaging using proton density fra uh, fraction okay this is one of the invasive non invasive tests to identify the amount of fat accumulated in the liver quantification of fat among the non invasive tests to detect fibrosis we have magnetic resonance elastography transient elastography and fibro scan okay these are very important fibro scan has become very popular these days now liver biopsy will confirm the diagnosis as i said it is a diagnosis of exclusion and liver biopsy will often be required to confirm the diagnosis the stage of the disease and rule out other liver diseases okay what will be the gold standard finding in the histopathology of liver biopsy there will be macrovascular steatosis means big droplet of fat will be accumulated in the hepatocytes hepatic parenchyma diffuse or centrilobular steatosis the uh, steatosis or fat accumulation may be diffuse or it may be centrilobular parenchymal inflammation will be there which will be suggested by infiltration by polymorphonuclear neutrophils lymphocytes and other mononuclear cells there be hepatocyte necrosis and ballooning hepatocyte degeneration so these are the gold standard finding in the histopathological examination of liver biopsy from a case of nfld macrovascular steatosis diffuse or centrilobular steatosis parenchymal inflammation in the form of infiltration by different inflammatory cells hepatocyte necrosis and ballooning degeneration of hepatocytes there are some other uncommon findings in the liver biopsy also less common findings i should say like perivenular perisinusoidal and periportal fibrosis mallory bodies and glycogenated nuclei lipogranuloma and stainable hepatic iron so these are some less common findings which we uh, can remember in the liver biopsy of a patient of nfld now for the diagnosis uh, the flow chart if you can remember we will suspect a patient of having nfld if we can uh, you know we can take a good history and do a good clinical evaluation though in the initial stages there will be not much finding but later on there will be features of advanced liver cell failure okay or hepatocellular failure and then we need to uh, initially what we can do we need to look for the serum transaminase level or hepatomegaly and then we need to exclude other causes of liver disease okay exclude excessive alcohol use and other forms of liver disease by history and laboratory test and then we can go ahead with imaging like ultrasonography or ct scan or mri we can do and then if needed we can go ahead with liver biopsy to confirm our diagnosis and there are non invasive test also we can do which uh, can quantify the amount of fat and which can quantify the amount of fibrosis or the level of fibrosis lastly coming to the most important part that is the treatment of a case of nfld now uh, treatment can be divided into uh, like a uh, few subheadings like specific therapy for nfld related liver disease treatment of nfld associated comorbidities and treatment of complications of advanced nfld so we need to give specific therapy for nfld then we need to take care of the comorbidities and then we need to take care of the complications which has developed as a result of advanced nfld now goals of treatment is to reduce the histologic features and improve insulin resistance and liver enzymes so this is the goal of our management now weight loss is a very important thing which should be done so weight loss uh, purpose what we can do we can give or we can advise a patient for a hypocaloric diet we can advise for increased physical activity bariatric surgery for patients with morbid obesity loss of at least 3 to 5 percent of body weight that is uh, very much helpful for steatosis and loss of 7 to 10 percent of weight is much helpful for non alcoholic steato hepatitis so exercise alone in adults with nfld may reduce hepatic steatosis but its ability to improve other aspects of liver histology remains unknown okay 
so uh, weight loss definitely should be advised for a patient and it is found to reduce hepatic steatosis significantly but other aspects of liver histology may uh, not be improved or the actual you know the ability of weight loss to impact these other liver histology is is uh, actually it remains unknown and resistance exercise for 45 to 60 minutes three times a week it improves intrahepatic uh, triglyceride accumulation as well as insulin resistance so this is important weight loss is a very important thing and uh, we really need to advise for weight loss for a patient of nfld we can advise for antioxidants oxidative stress is considered to be the key mechanism of hepatocellular injury and disease progression in subjects with nash so what are the antioxidants we can advise among the antioxidants vitamin e is a very important antioxidant which has been um you know uh, it's been used for nfld for a long time it is associated with a decrease in amino transferases in subject with nash it causes improvement in steatosis inflammation and ballooning and uh, ballooning degeneration and resolution of steatohepatitis in adults in nash it has no effect on hepatic fibrosis this we need to remember it can reduce inflammation and steatosis and all but it does not uh, have any good effect on hepatic fibrosis we're talking about vitamin e it is administered at daily dose of 800 international unit per day it improves liver histology in non-diabetic adults with biopsy proven nash and therefore it should be considered as a first line pharmacotherapy for this patient population next antioxidant is betaine a metabolic of uh, a metabolite of choline raises a uh, sam level sam stands for s adenosyl methionine level and decreases cellular oxidative damage betaine demonstrate improvement in hepatosteatosis only other aspects of liver histology are not affected by betaine so again we need to remember that betaine also it improves the hepatic steatosis but other things in the liver histology may not be improved with betaine insulin sensitizers are very important thiazolidinones can be used to treat biopsy proven nash but long term safety and efficacy have not been established okay pioglitazone it uh, can be used at a dose of 30 mg per day it improves insulin resistance by increasing glucose disposal in muscle and decreasing hepatic glucose output Pyglitazone, it causes weight gain, but it significantly improves amino transferases, steatosis, ballooning, and inflammation. Metformin is one more insulin sensitizer. It's a biguanide. Okay, it reduces hyperinsulinemia, and it increases hepatic insulin sensitivity. Okay, and it improves hepatomegaly and hepatic steatosis. So it is not recommended as a specific treatment for liver disease in adults with NASH. Okay. Saroglitazer. Sar what is saroglitazer? It is a dual peroxisome proliferator activated receptor, alpha and gamma agonist. Okay. P P A R. Okay. It is dual peroxisome proliferator activated receptor, alpha and gamma agonist. It improves insulin sensitivity and lipid and glycemic parameters. Saroglitazer improved Nash histology and various studies cytoprotective agents can also be used though they do not have any exact proven benefit they are thought to prevent apoptosis and down regulate the inflammatory cascade like arsodeoxycholic acid omega-3 fatty acids reduces steatosis and pentoxifilin so these are the cytoprotective agents can be used lipid lowering agents like statins can be used patients with nfld or nash are not at high risk for serious liver injury from statins that we need to remember when you prescribe statin to a patient of nfld or nash lastly the ultimate thing which can be done is liver transplantation so nfld uh, patient ultimately they may require liver transplantation when the medical management has failed or uh, there has been not much of improvement with the medical management but we need to remember that nfld may recur if there is persistent risk factors so we really need to address the risk factors as well before we plan for liver transplantation so this is all about NFLD which I wanted to discuss today. I hope this class was helpful for you. If you have any queries, please uh, mention it in the comment section. Thank you so much for listening.